this cast was pretty pretty on point like I mean everybody has pretty greatly skilled give me a page please thank you uh, the people who are part of this drama department are fantastic uh, I was really wanting to work with Paula and very very fortunate that it was this show which is such a fantastic show that I was working on with her it's taking, it, um, taking shape it's beginning to take shape exactly I mean, in the beginnings, like, yeah, a few people were struggling, like, with rehearsals. I mean, like, when it comes to, like, mem uh, memorizing lines. But, I mean, I was sitting there and talking to Paula, and I'm like, you know, Paula, like, even though all these people are having problems, you have a lot of spotlight actors. Like, when, when it's showtime, they'll just click into it, and they'll do it. Um, well, for me, um, it starts with identifying with your character um, and transforming myself into that character. So everybody is here in the room? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the rest of you, please, here by 10 to uh, your call at the latest. I guess this show came to my mind because I had the actors for it. It's a wonderful play. I've done it before, 42 years ago. It was one of the first things I ever directed and loved it working on it. It's very apropos. It's come back into, uh, it, well, it's never gone out of uh, popularity, but it's really popular now because it's, it resonates so, so well with what's going on in the world. So really what this this whole scene is about, and what Danforth has to say, is it, it's all about the erasure of reasonable doubt. Paul is going for um, a feeling of not necessarily paranoia, but of fear. Um, there's a lot of fear going around at the time. I mean, someone could, could point you out, and within a day, you'd be dead. Uh, we are producing The Crucible by Arthur Miller, and uh, this is a show set in the 1700s in Massachusetts, uh, surrounding the Salem Witch Trials and the hysteria revolving around uncertainty and fear and having these young girls be found doing things that are very against what the Puritan society would be okay with and the resulting kind of uh, fear caused by these actions um, leading to a witch hunt. So the first thing that I said to, uh, when I started talking about it, was um, the trees. Just the trees in the sense of the brooding presence of, and the oversight of, of the trees, of the unknown. Um, then Kevin told me that uh, Lisa, his wife, Lisa Amaral Wright, was willing to design the set. What I've done is I've got basic floor plans. I have not put the furniture on. I have the furniture here. I have elevations of what I'm thinking that the walls should look like so that we can kind of confer. Mm -hmm. um, from our the theater is very, very much a collaborative effort. As, as I've said before, mood and feeling are, are such an important part of it. Um, color choices, texture choices, all of that um, tends to be used as a way to convey the feelings of the play. The trees coming in over top of the set give us sort of that oppressive feel. There's always the concept and one of the things that uh, Paul and I discussed, the concept of being watched. The things that we had discussed were she wanted walls, I suggested that you know it, they be wood walls with with um, some gaps in the wood, just so that we get a little bit of light bleed, an uneven top, so that we're not leveling off the top of the stage. Trees in the background, kind of coming up and giving us that sort of encroaching feeling. So I did uh, a floor plan. And then I did front elevations to give her an idea of where I was thinking that windows and doors and that type of thing would be. And we moved a couple of things around, turned a couple of doors into windows and vice versa. And then that gave me the basics to go away. 
redo the, uh, the floor plans per scene and also to build the model to give her an idea of what I was talking about and also it gives her a chance to move things around on the stage. In previous years, when myself and Scott were designing sets, neither of us trained as scenic designers and often dealing with directors who can't necessarily visualize in three dimensions. We would use this program where we could sketch out quite quickly in the space, because we have uh, scale renderings of the theater, here's what it would look like, does this work for you as a director? And because it's to scale and because we built stuff this way, we could then take those rough sketches and turn them into our actual construction drawings. Because we have it in computer rendering and because with this show we have openings that in this scene is a door opening, in this scene has a door in it, in this scene has a window in it, in this scene has a flat wall in it, we were able to give two-dimensional printouts from audience view for Paula say, here is scene one, here is scene two, here is scene three, here is scene four, with how it sits in there, which helps her to visualize what the set looks like. We build a lot of our furniture, uh, but not all of it, for various reasons. It's always a balance. Especially with something like the Crucible that's a period piece, furniture look different. You've got specifics that Lisa and Paula have built into the look of the show that everything's pushing forward, that that's where we are, and that's when we are. And we want a certain look of the pieces. We have these two benches here that we really like the look of. They're very simple. They're the kind of things that the Puritans might have used. But we need four. So what I have to do is build two more of them, except that, as in many cases in theater, the pieces have to do double, if not triple, duty. They have to be benches. But in the first scene, they become the support for the bed. Do you want to start with the women's? Yeah, I feel like the women will be the pickiest. Just like... They have no choice. <laughs> if it fits yeah, them, right? they, they wear it. No and if we not, wore hijabs, they have no choice. Yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. When they complain, I yeah, no. get to be uglier. I want the green. <laughs> what do you Did want? you grab these ones? No, no, they just came in here. Okay. Well, oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I win this time, bitch. <laughs> Jen. <laughs> Put that in the documentary. <laughs> this is actually for me. Yeah, go okay. Yeah, okay. and if they don't look good on, then switch. Then yeah. Trade. Ah! <laughs> I'm Brienne Booth, and I'm a fourth year TAP student, so I'll be graduating this year. This is gonna be my last experience working on a TAP show, but I'm the costume coordinator this year because it's set the end of the 17th century, everything has to be so exact and they're Puritans, so they can't have short sleeves, they have to have the right collar, everything just has to look very authentic. Uh, the whole outfit uh, with all the buttons and frills kind of says like, I am great, I am a person of status, and I think that kind of translates right into uh, the type of character he is. So I think it's a kind of a physical display of who I am, and you can kind of feel the status before I breathe a word. It wasn't just a matter of to seeing like how we could make them, like costumes that were from a different period look Puritan. It was like we needed something that was almost very authentic and that someone else had created for the Crucible. Because it's a period piece, we didn't just have the stuff lying around, so it was Definitely all about networking, trying to see who everyone knew, to see how many contacts we could get a hold of. So we ended up renting from about four places. So it was just a matter of taking them up, taking them in. One of the other girls in the program all make the bonnets for the girls. And like, it was just, the shoes needed buckles. It was, we needed every last detail of these costumes that didn't necessarily come with the rented ones. Yes, uh, there's a petticoat, there's layers and layers. Apparently Puritans love to uh, wear layers and layers. There's a petticoat and then there's a dress and then there's an apron, there's a collar. Uh, that does up at the front and not the back, which is contrast to popular belief. And a bonnet and uh, the married women have the hair up because they're not to be flaunting that. John, I have nine men outside. You cannot keep her. The law binds me, John. I cannot budge. You'll see her taken, Proctor. The court is just. Oh, Pontius Pilate. 
God will not let you wash your hands of this. John, I think I must go with them. There are standard practices in theatrical lighting design that, of how you shape people's faces. It's similar to portrait photography, where you have a light behind them and a light to one side and a, a, a simulation of a lower light to the other side that gives them shape of the face, but you can light it. And that is what people subconsciously expect to see when they come to the theater. The crucible, all the lights are shifted. Everything's slightly out of whack with that. So the standard angles that you would light from, it isn't. We've been working on getting all the gels and the lights, focusing them, and after that comes the level set, which is when the, uh, a bit more of the artistry comes out. The rest of it is more practicality and a bit more formulaic, and in some ways, it's, that's the mathematical side, figuring out how much light you need and where uh, to give yourself options so that you can balance it and change the mood and feeling using the colors that you've chosen. We have, a, we have a few different lights that we're using. Um, the lights that we mostly use here are the Fresnels and the Lico's, which are the ones that we're going to be using for everything else. The advantage of having Lico is you can do things like put a gobo in it, which casts interesting shadows, which you can't do with Fresnel. When you're doing lighting, the colors that go together you tend to play with warms and cools and ambers and blues. And we pushed that a little bit outside that. There's a lavender color, which is the light that's coming from this way right now, that's just a little dirtier looking. It's got a little bit of grit to it. The ambers and the blues we've got just don't quite mesh together properly, but also has that same grittiness, dirtiness, that as we add it to things, gives that sense of something's being wrong with the world. I want to open myself. I want the light of God. I want the sweet love of Jesus. I danced for the devil. I saw Alice Barrow with the devil. I saw Goody Goody Hawkins with with the devil. devil. I saw Mr. Brighton with the devil. I saw Goody Cobb with the devil. I saw Goody Franklin with the devil. I saw Goody Hopper with the devil. I had never acted in a serious drama before. It had always been comedies, just from me when I was a kid. It was just be the funny guy, comedy, 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 left, right, and center. So. Uh, so I was very happy Paul gave me the opportunity to take on a serious role, which is uh, what I've always wanted to do. And um, I didn't quite know what I was getting into in terms of, as you were saying, it is a very wordy play. It's a very long play. Uh, so it was quite the challenge. With Jacob, it was, it was um, I don't have much experience with a serious drama because he's a comic performer. He does stand-up. He does improv. He'd never done a role like this. The Devil's Book? Did he come with a book? In serious theater, there's a big disconnect between Jacob's brain and his body. His body does not do what his brain wants to do, or it didn't. It didn't to begin with in rehearsals. And the biggest, the biggest uh, problem for a while was he was gesticulating on every word. I know that you, you, least of all Thomas, would ever wish so disastrous a charge. And then one Lay day in one on- rehearsal, it's funny, you know, some, with some actors, all they need is some physical uh, touchstones and things follow from there. So one day in rehearsal, I saw him, he just decided that he would just put one one hand behind his back in a kind of very interesting way. I don't know what it was about it, but I liked it. I thought, that's very good for the character. I said, what if this is a problem that Paris has? Not Jacob Hogan, Paris. Paris gestures too much, and he knows it. And he knows that it weakens him. So he catches himself doing it, and he stops it. And we make it into a character thing. Well, that, that was very useful for Jacob. You call this sport? <laughs> Teach you what? <laughs> what I'm doing is, uh, it's uh, you know, kind of basic stage combat stuff. Shut Essentially, um, if you approach it like a dance, anytime there's physical contact um, that is aggressive between two characters um, in a play, 
typically you want to bring in someone who can choreograph it so that the actors don't get hurt. In terms of the stuff that was going on in the bed, um, so the victim is, is always in control of situations like that. So in that scene, Betty is the one um, jumping back and the other girls are there to catch her. Um, and what happens, it's like playing something uh, kind of in reverse, right? Where it, it looks like it's happening um, with a high impact, but it's, they're actually guiding her down. <laughs> being directed by Paulo uh, only once before. Previously, there was a class in the first semester that I took with Paula, and we did little scenes from uh, The Glass Menagerie, Tennessee Williams, and it was awesome, and I loved working with Paula. I think that her directing style kind of uh, challenges me in my individual kind of like obstacles that I face on a daily basis. I feel like she knows where I need to work and she pushes me to do it. She's going to come down. She's walking the beam. Will you sleep? I cannot. I, I cannot. Ah, I cannot. Okay. Look out. She's coming down. Ah! <laughs> okay. Scream, 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 scream. They stop, and then you keep going. <laughs> okay, cool. Screaming madly. I mean, it's a big show. It's a big show. So the, the notion of letting the actors kind of wander around and figure out where they would like to be would be difficult. But, yeah, asking their opinion or listening to their opinion, I'd be crazy not to, you know? Um, because, again, it's a teaching situation. I'm trying to teach them how to rehearse. The director's not a sergeant major. The director is, as you, you know, you see it. You just, you're going with everything that they give you. You're pulling out whatever you can find. You're trying to uh, work through the, the through line of the play. Um, and you're trying, as the director, you're trying to see it as the audience will see it. Um, I have to do uh, in staging what the camera does in, in film, right? The camera shows the audience what to look at. But I have to do it through focus, through direction, through, and that's why you saw me, um, first of all, running around constantly adjusting people so that everybody in the audience can see everybody at all times, but also trying to figure out um, where my eye went. If my eye went over there and it's supposed to be over there, what can I do? to make sure that it goes over there. Uh, so that moment with Zach, um, when he has to sit Mary Warren down, and then he has to say, she's a whore, that was why I made that adjustment, because my eye stayed over here. Even after he'd said, she's a whore, and I was trying to figure out why that was, it was because I needed him to move. How dare you call heaven whore? Whore! John! Man! It is what a whore! Do you... It is a whore! You ch you charge! Yes! <laughs> yes. Yes. Sorry, that's me! Mr. Depp, please lie. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh. Our eyes, the audience's eye, will go to anything that moves. So if you want something to be said uh, and heard, nobody moves while that is being said. So we will watch a person who is speaking, and we will continue to watch a person who is speaking until someone moves. And if someone moves in the wrong place, immediately the eyes go over there and we stop listening. So it's one of the fundamental um, rules of directing, right? To just constantly use yourself as the director, as the audience. There's another judgment that awaits us all. Hang them high over the town. Whoever weeps for these, weeps for corruption. I've had no breakfast. Come.
go to him, could he procure? There is yet time. Go to him. Proctor! Proctor! Woman, plead with him. In his pride, in his vanity, be his helper, what profit him to bleed? Shall the dust praise him? Shall the worms declare his truth? Go to him, take his shame away. He have his goodness now. God forbid I should take it from him. <laughs>